injecting the jawline, injection points, and safety tips. That's what we're covering on this week's show. This is a very complex, challenging area that many clinicians initially love on their training and then hate when they get back to their clinics because of the variety of different jawlines that we're challenged to treat. So in this week's show, we're going to cover how I approach different types of jawlines, where to inject, and how to do it safely so that you don't make mistakes and don't get the complications so many of us worry about. Let's have a quick recap on the anatomy that I'll be thinking about before I inject a jawline. The first thing is to be aware of um, the structures underneath. Obviously, we have the parotid gland, which sits here inferior to the zygoma, and it's a rather large structure that sits on top of the master muscle, which runs down underneath it like this. In front of the master muscle, which is our defining point of the jawline, is where the facial artery emerges, and that curls up, heading towards the ala base, where it becomes angular artery. Obviously, we're not injecting anywhere near there. We also have the submental artery. This is the one that we see occluded during chin vascular occlusion. So a little artery that comes up on the anterior part of the mandible. Um, typically not quite on the bone, but it can be on the bone, and it's typically not on the midline, although it can also occasionally be on the midline, I think more commonly in females. So those are by far and away the most important structures to be aware of, and the first thing I'll do when treating a jawline is just to feel for the notch in the jaw which tells you where the facial artery is, and if you're using an ultrasound, do a scan around the chin to see where you, those vessels are so that you can best choose the right instrument if you're using a cannula or a needle and you're placing it in a place where the vessel is not. This will help you. Uh, we also have the mental artery, but this is pretty small and isn't actually a place where we tend to put needles very often. And if you're using a cannula, it's probably small enough and easier enough to move out the way to not be particularly high risk. For me, the ones to worry about are primarily the submental artery and then the facial artery just because of its size. So what are the aesthetics of the jawline that we need to understand? If you're going to create a treatment plan that actually makes your patient more beautiful, we need to have a clear goal and we need to pick the right patients who can actually go on that journey. So the goal with a female jawline is actually for it to be less dominant in the face than the cheeks. So we want petite chins, which terminate in usually in the midpoint. We want a narrower gonial angle so that the cheeks dominate over the jawline. Um, and we tend to want it to be relatively narrow and pointed downward, so it creates a heart-shaped face. Now, in men, it's very different, and in many ways, men's jawlines are easier because they just need to be bigger and more dominant. So you can just add product that creates a shape and not worry so much about over-treatment, whereas in females, it's very easy to tilt them into looking masculine by making them wider at any point. So chin, jawline, gonial angle, all of those, when they tilt too far, become masculinizing. Um, when you look at the face from a profile, we also can decide about how far we need to project. Now, I think many chins can actually break the facial plane. So the facial plane usually runs from the nasian down towards the chin. And in many diagrams will be shown with the chin being flush with the nasian. But uh, if you look at really good looking people, often the chin is a little bit stronger than that. So I'm not sure how well that really matches. They look completely fine and neutral when they match the facial plane, but projecting beyond it, beyond it a little bit. Picture, for example, Liz Hurley, slightly strong chin. Same with, I need to think of some younger actresses. I, these, I, it's really giving my age away so badly. So if you take, for example, Margot Robbie, if you look at her side profile, in fact, I found a picture of her where it was described as the profile of a goddess, it clearly breaks the facial plane. So I'm not so afraid of over-projection a little bit, according to that rule, but I am definitely afraid of inferior projection in a female and making them look masculine. So the two aspects, the lateral and the inferior, that are most commonly over-treated. Sometimes you only just get a little bump here where the under part of the chin has been over-treated and it doesn't quite fit into the jawline. And this is actually probably leads to one of the hardest parts of doing the jawline, which is that it's actually the meeting point of multiple facial planes. So you can't adjust one without affecting the other. So every injection needs to take account of where the other facial planes are meeting. And this is why when you see me do jawlines, I'm often looking across the patient like this the whole time, trying to get a three-dimensional awareness of what's going on and you never treat the patient just looking at one side while you're injecting it otherwise what you end up with is beautiful definition then when they turn their head they look wider and longer than they should 
Think about all the planes and inject accordingly to the feminine shape we're trying to create in females or a more masculine shape you're trying to create in men. And it's for this reason why men are easier because over projection, over widening, making the chin wider is less of a critical error than in a female. So common injection points, if you're treating a female, it is useful to start with the gonial angle, remembering not to make it too straight. I'm not a fan of a completely straight jawline in a female. I think it's an adolescent boy that looks like that. It typically is, uh, it's, it's edgy, which a lot of beauty is edgy but it can easily tip into just looking gaunt or masculine. So a little bit in the gonial angle, that's my main injection point laterally. Then we have the chin, and in the female, we tend to have a central injection point. In a men, you have two injection points either side. Now the actual injection point will change according to whether I want to project anteriorly, inferiorly, or a mix of both, which is very common. In fact, the most common way I inject chins with females is so that the path of the needle reflects the path of the jawline as if the chin is being continued rather than the front of the chin just being added on. So I'm trying to change all three planes simultaneously rather than just treat one and then correct it and then inject somewhere else. So the injection point varies according to where I'm intending the projection to go. So lateral, anterior, inferior, or a mix of all. So next I wanna share with you a case study. This patient has absolutely nailed the problem. So check out this. You guys are considering getting jaw filler. Please stay and watch this video because I'm about to show you guys a horror story of what happened to my face. All right, so this was my face before I ever touched it, put filler in it or anything. So I have always had, genetically speaking, a fuller, more round face. And when I went in and I actually spoke with the lady doing my actual jaw filler, she told me that it would make my face more slim looking and chiseled because obviously you're going to have more of like a chiseled jawline versus a chubby jawline. You get it, you get what I'm saying. So after I consulted with her, me being a newbie, me not really knowing much about jaw fillers, she convinced me to go ahead and get, I believe it was called Radius, which is a filler that is non-dissolvable, which is number one biggest red flag. Do not get anything that is non-dissolvable. If it's not gonna dissolve in your face and you don't like the outcome, you cannot take it away. And that's exactly what happened to me and I was scarred for two years. And I'm gonna show you a picture next. This is what I was left with right after I got it done. And I was, terrified as you guys can see my jaw first of all i have high cheekbones so the high cheekbones the fact that my high cheekbones don't match and these protrude outward more than my high cheekbones it makes me look more masculine as you guys can see my face now it is more heart shaped so it goes inward which is more feminine Nothing wrong with a lady that has more of a masculine jawline that's also beautiful but it doesn't fit my face because I have higher cheekbones and it looks weird. So the day after I started noticing that my left side was coming out way more than my right side and it looked really weird. I ended up calling her. Obviously I feel like every person would call and she reassured me that it would go back to normal. It didn't. My face looked so unsymmetrical and horrible for two years. So I went from this to this and this lasted me two years. So my advice to anybody wanting to get jaw filler is nine times out of 10, you are going to be looking at the side profile of jaw filler. I've only seen those pictures floating around and that's because the only difference in the jaw filler is the side. If anything, it makes your like front profile way more masculine. So make sure you're going to somebody that knows what they're doing. So she's figured it out. The profile picture, the, the pictures that you see online of jaw lines that look perfectly straight, they're always like this. And you'll notice many people even do this unconsciously in pictures. When they take a picture of themselves, it makes your jawline look better. Now, the problem with this approach is that what the clinician has done in this case is they have made a defined jawline, but only from one angle. As soon as the face rotates to look straight at you, you end up with this bulkiness, which from the side creates a lovely shadow and they look better. But our faces are three dimensional and most of the time we're looking at people. So she felt a downgrade in her appearance um, overall down to this treatment, also using a non-reversal product. Now, I'm not a fan of non-reversal products and I don't know why they're still so popular because we have hyaluronic acids that now last similar lengths of time and you can easily reverse them. The drug companies who make these do not like me. In fact, I've even had letters trying to get me to take my videos down and good luck with that because we're talking to a clinical audience. I'm not, I don't actually sell any treatments through my page. So I can talk about these prescription products. Um, and I really hate the idea that they've tried to get these things removed. 
from my page because they don't want to have the negative press. It's really important that patients know the risks of non-reversible products. And they're not saying they're not right for someone, but they're not right for the average person because surely you'd want the option of reversibility. This patient had to have a downgrade in her self-esteem and her confidence for two years because of a product that was not able to be dealt with appropriately. If you'd like to learn much more about the anatomy, more than you've ever learned on any cadaver course and on any textbook that you've ever bought, make sure you join me on something I'm developing, especially for clinicians. It's the 3D anatomy experience. I don't think there's a better way to learn anatomy. So make sure you sign up. To find out more, just click the link in the description below.